Today, we've got questions on Empress Elizabeth of Austria, the institution of court jester, and Charles's favorite political dynasties in America. Welcome to another episode of Off the Menu, now being broadcast and podcast on the Crusade Channel. Talk radio the way it should be at crusadechannel.com. I'm your host, Vincent Franchini from Tumblr House, here with a miasmal Charles Coulomb. Miasmal? Miasmal? Seriously? Yeah, like miasma. Yeah. So I'm like this effluvians, this foul-smelling mist? More or less, yeah. <laughs> that is just, that's foul. What a thing to say. What about the children who watch this show? What are they going to think? They don't know I mean, what I'm saying. Oh yeah, you think not? How how would you how would you have liked it if if Dennis Prager's uh, sidekick, uh, the gentle Gentile giant, three G man, what if he had said in the midst of uh, Dennis Prager's happiness hour, "You're miasmal." Don't you think that would have harshed his mellow? Probably, but I don't care. You don't care about Dennis Prager. Who's Dennis Prager? Just kidding. The, I, <laughs> Hushaba, Hushaba. I don't know who is Dennis Prager. He's some conservative I'll guy my mom talks about. I don't know. Why don't he, you bring him up? Prager.edu. He's got. Uh, he's just one of yeah. the. Isn't he one of the talking heads for the conservative? Yeah, he's one of the big one of the big timers. You like him? He's okay. I mean, I, I've on and off. I've listened to him since the late '60s, early '70s, when he was doing Religion on the Line. It's wonderful to see to that someone who's so much older than I am is still going. Oh, is he? Wow. Okay, that's good. I don't. I don't like listening to these people because all they do is complain. Not during his happiness hour. Then he's all about happiness. Happiness hour as as compared to happy hour? So he's got happiness yeah. hour? Oh, yes, and believe me, I, I've never yet heard one of his happiness hours that made me as happy as a happy hour I did. But, uh, no, he's basically one hour a week he goes on about what makes happiness. Okay, what makes happiness? Well, it differs from week to week, but his biggest message is that gratitude will make you happy. That makes sense, yeah. If you cultivate an attitude of gratitude, you will be happy. Although you mustn't let your attitude of gratitude become a platitude. Why not? At, at, at any latitude. Okay, I'm going to need one more rhyme, and then I will accept. The... <laughs> oh, you are cruel. <laughs> All right, let's see. Let's see. We can do this, I think, maybe. I don't know maybe we can. Uh, let's see. Gratitude, attitude, gratitude, uh, platitude, latitude. <sighs> Amplitude? What's up? Amplitude? No, that doesn't rhyme. Um, I'm afraid you have boxed us in a wall of your own <laughs> making. I hope you're you're pleased with yourself. Uh, I am pleased a little bit. Well, it's self-acceptance is the key <laughs> to mental health. That's what everyone agrees on. So, you know, uh, yeah, you're back from your trip. I sure are. I was in Denmark for the Latin Mass men's retreat, men's retreat, which was wonderful, and I saw some really amazing examples of Danish culture. Um, yelling, which. It is to to Denmark what Glastonbury is to Britain, what Tara is to Ireland, what Reims is to France. It is the the center, the beginning, the the core of that country's Christianity and, and becoming Christian. What what is yelling? It's called. It's in yelling and screaming. Yelling. That's a place. Yeah, in Denmark. Oh, okay. I thought I thought you were talking about the verb. Uh, no, 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 no. I'm talking about the place name. And uh, yelling is where Harold Bluetooth, uh, by the way, here's this is for you. Yeah, Mystery Science uh, Theater 3000. Yeah. Very good. Yeah. Just wanted to reassure you. 
Mm-hmm. Mm. Thank you. You're welcome. Um, no, so that was where Harold Bluetooth converted to Christianity and began the great adventure of Danish Catholicism. When I was done there, uh, I saw um, I saw some very interesting places in Jutland. Well, that was also in Jutland. I saw uh, Viborg, which is an old town, and Aarhus, which is an older town. Both were really, really lovely, very medieval. Um, and then in Randers, Denmark, I saw an authentic reproduction of uh, Elvis Presley's Graceland, his, the little shack he was born in, a statue of Elvis, and uh, neighboring it, the uh, Johnny Cash Museum. In Denmark? Yep. They're big over there? I guess. So that that was interesting. But uh, I had a really great time. As always, the Danish Catholic uh, guys were, Danish Latin Mass Catholic guys were great. And then I flew to England, and um, I stayed in a, a wonderful uh, old coaching inn called the Checkers Inn uh, in Wotton, which is this place between High Wickham and Beaconsfield. And at the uh, Royal Standard Pub uh, or Tavern in Beaconsfield, it's out in the middle of nowhere in the woods, uh, Sebastian Morello and Joseph Law and myself, Joseph uh, Sebastian Morello of the uh, European Conservative, Joseph Law of the Latin Mass Society of Great Britain, or of England, rather, because it's not in Scotland. They have a separate Latin Mass Society of Scotland. And myself did a, a um, three-hour-long podcast, which I understand the European Conservative will edit and put out in three pieces. What, what was Joseph who? Shaw. Oh, I thought you said Law. Yeah, it's Shaw. Um, Shaw, no, no, Jude Law was there too, yeah. Jude Law? That makes sense. Yeah, yeah. Pope? he was hanging yeah. out with us, yeah. Yeah, he was hanging out. He gave, gave us his insights. And then he mostly stuck by the bar, though. Uh, no, but seriously, the, the Royal Standard was amazing. It was, to me, the archetype of the English pub. And it claims to be one of the oldest in the country, if not the oldest. So that was nice. And we went to G.K. Chesterton's grave, passed by his house and his church, uh, St. Teresa of Avila. The next day, which was the day I had to fly home here, in the morning, I went out to Hewenden Manor, which was uh, Disraeli's home, Benjamin Disraeli's home. And I saw his grave and all that. So that, it was it was a wonderful trip. Excellent. Really, really great. But now I find that when midnight comes, we're leaving September behind. Yeah, we're moving into October. How do you feel about you that? We're entering the October country. We sure are. And this, I mean... For me, Michaelmas, St. Michael's Feast, is the gateway to adventure. First the October country, then the month of all souls, then the advent of Christmas, and the long, long celebration of Christmas into Candlemas and then Mardi Gras. I, I love this time of year, though, because it's all still um, in anticipation. Halloween and Thanksgiving and it's it's all waiting for us, but it's not here yet. And the lights of Christmas waiting beyond it. Oh, I love this time of year. And really, it's it's my favorite my favorite time of the year, all the way from as I say, Michaelmas to Mardi Gras. Favorite time of the year, without any doubt. Did did you have poetry for us? Did you have some poetry? Do I have poetry? I got lots of stuff. For starters, because you mentioned the October country, we've got to quote the king of the October country, the man who popularized the term, Ray Bradbury. And this is a description of October country. That country where it is always turning late in the year. That country where the hills are fog and the rivers are mist, where noons go quickly, dusks and twilights linger, and midnights stay. 
That country composed in the main of cellars, subcellars, coal bins, closets, attics, and pantries faced away from the sun. That country whose people are autumn people, thinking only autumn thoughts, whose people passing at night on the empty walks sound like rain. Isn't that lovely? Hmm, that's nice. And while we're on that theme, H.P. Lovecraft, with one of my favorite of his poems, despite its somewhat length, is October. And he really sums up this, this wonderful, glorious time. Here it is. October, H.P. Lovecraft. Mellow-faced with eyes of fairy, wistful clad in tinted leaves, See the brown October tarry by the golden rose of sheaves. Oak and acorn in his garland, fruit and wineskin in his hands. Mystic pilgrim from a far land, down the road to fatherlands. Softly treading, gently breathing, casting spells on wood and wold. Vines with purple clusters wreathing, witching bows to red and gold. Bearing sickle in their pleasure when the harvest toil is o'er, and the autumn's garnered treasure lies within the festive door. Bearing dreams to all who listen as he sounds his elfin horn, where the crystal vapors glisten past the farther hills at morn, where the sunset hovers playing on the teeming cottage yard, till the cryptic night comes straying in a mitre tall and starred. Dreams elusive and uncertain, Fleeting as the dying year, glimpses from behind the curtain, half to cherish, half to fear. Memories that charm and beckon, vanished scene, vanished face. Phantoms past the worlds we reckon, reaching from the wells of space. Mounting as with necromancy, welcome visions hold the sight. Bygone fields assail the fancy, radiant in a golden light. Ancient lanes lead cool, lead, uh, lead cool and bending past remembered farms and byres, where the curling smoke ascending tells of happier autumn fires. I can catch the flaming riot of the oaks and elms I know, and the breathless ruddy quiet of the sunset spectral glow, and the farmhouse chimney peeping through the scarlet maple shade, and the gorgeous fruits of reaping by the door in order laid. Greens that red and yellow dapple, tints that match the blazing sky, swelling pumpkin, rosy apple, clustered grapes of Tyrian dye, and behind the orchard reaching where the rolling meadows abide, I can see the corn shocks bleaching and the stubble stretching wide. Skies alive with southern winging, ravens perched on the sheaf and stack, groves with eager trumpets ringing as the quarry flees the pack. Swains with nuts and faggots plodding homeward to twilight goth, soon to cluster warm and nodding round their cider and their half. Notes of village bells are soaring, peaceful in their vesper tune, as an eerie light comes pouring from the rising hunter's moon. Wild above the wooded mountains, weirdly shining on the streams, yellow floods from haunted fountains, witches dancing in the beams. Half-seen sights from outer distance, half-heard sounds from other spheres, beat with goblin-born insistence on the spirit's eyes and ears. Thoughts have thought, and yearnings sober, formless as the autumn smoke. These thy gifts obscure October, October. these the symbols of thy yoke. Mellow-faced with eyes of fairy, wistful clad in tinted leaves, See the brown October tarry by the golden rose of sheaves. Oak and acorn in his garland, fruit and wineskin in his hands. Mystic pilgrim from a far land, down the road to fatherlands. Who's the mystic pilgrim? October itself. Mm. Interesting. And don't forget, we, we, we'll probably see it several times as the year crawls toward its end. But let's not forget, 
The veil between the worlds is very thin this time of year. Uh, <laughs> oh, now that you say that, that's actually a good reminder for me. Uh, if you have Halloween type questions, send them on in, both patrons and non patrons alike. Um, I'm, I've started to pocket them for, uh, I think it's going to be October 30th episode, the day before Halloween, I think. So we'll, you know, try to be thematic that day. So send in your stuff. Um, yeah. I, I've got something very Lovecraftian for you. Okay. Imagine this. Imagine a political debate. Now, you know how Lovecraft stories are. Everything gets, it starts out normal, but things are just getting creepier and creepier. Yeah. So you're sitting there at your television, right? Yeah. And, and the date gives what sounds like a canned, but reasonable thing. But as each candidate gets up, they become more and more bizarre and incoherent and strange. And then you begin to wonder. Is it you or is it them? What is going on? Until finally, the last of them just babbles pointlessly about nothing in particular. And yet no one seems to notice. Is it them or is it you? Wouldn't that be a scary Lovecraftian thing? (laughs) <laughs> Welcome to my world, Charles. <laughs> oh, you're not talking about the Republican debate, are you? I am. <laughs> was was it Lovecraftian enough for you? It, 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 honestly, I mean, some of the candidates were literally doing what you your little satire about. Well, we need resources for capitalism, and we we need to defend the family and and the individual, and we need law. We need to enforce our law. <laughs> you know, and I mean, we, like, we, like like the very basics. Keep, we need to enforce our law, and we need to keep freedom unrestricted. <sighs> Children must be able to play safely and freely. Education must impart knowledge. <laughs> it's the very basics, the societal basics we're uttering. It's like it's like they didn't even bother to study for the exam. Like, oh yeah, you're going to be in the debate. That's okay. I know all the things. We're, I'm just going to say all the all the all the things uh, that every country would would like, and I'm going to have it r- wrapped up in a nice little 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 box with a bow on, and everyone will take it. None of our citizens should die of starvation on our streets. <laughs> yeah, so. Well, if it makes you feel better, you know I'm a boomer. You know this. Yeah, I know this, yes. Well, your description of your horror at the debate, it brought an old boomer song to mind. Okay. Not the whole thing, just the tail end of it. From Simon and Garfunkel's Mrs. Robinson. Sitting on a sofa on a Sunday afternoon. Listen to the candidates debate. Laugh about it, shout about it, when you've got to choose. Any way you look at it, you lose. Where have you gone? Joe DiMaggio, a nation turns its lonely eyes to you. Woo, woo, woo. What's that you say, Mrs. Robinson? Jolton Joe has left and gone away. Hey, hey, hey. Hey, hey, hey. There it is. It's true. Yeah. Did you think of uh, Joe DiMaggio when you were watching it? Did you turn your lonely eyes to him? I, well, I don't were, think of Joe DiMaggio much, no. Would you have done that had you been a boomer, do you think? If it was in your head, you'd been, I mean, the way it is in all of ours, and you've been sitting there watching on the TV, do you think that's what would have come into your head? 
I I don't know what goes on in a boomer's head, honestly. Um, sure. What? Joe DiMaggio. No, you know what? No, I I think that's kind of a lie because that's sort of like a return to like good old fashioned values. Yeah. What, what happened with that, boomers? What happened with that? Where did that go? Well, we revolted. We tore them down and replaced them with the filth we're giving you. <laughs> what? See, let me tell you something, Mr. E, Mr. Grandpa Millennial. Let me tell you something, okay? You look at this as, oh, the boomers inherited something great, and they ripped it down and spat upon it and, and slid it in the mud, and they left us a pile of garbage. That's what you think. The reality is that we've left you a series of character-building challenges. That's that's a nice way to to say it, I guess. That's a see. When I wake up at night in a cold sweat, worrying about what we've done to you, my my immediate thought is, no, uh, we've given them character building challenges, and then I feel better again. I can go back to sleep. So, so what are they singing about in the song? I mean, I don't understand. I mean, now in the context of of representing boomer values i don't understand like all right basically again you've got to remember that mrs robinson comes from a time when my older brothers were young and i was a little boy okay so we're back to the late 60s and basically it was for a, a movie called the graduate which uh is actually based upon a real occurrence in pasadena california where a um, a woman, uh, a, a noted Pasadena housewife, uh, hostess, socialite, uh, seducted her uh, daughter's fiance. I mean, did it have and to be based on something? That's not the most notable thing in the world. It is if you lived in Pasadena in the late 60s. But it was turned into the book The Graduate, which became the movie The Graduate with Dustin Hoffman. Mrs. Robinson was the uh, the bad girl in the uh, piece, and the song was written for the film. And the idea, of course, there's several things at once being presented, one of them being that this is an elder. So bear in mind, this is pre a pre-boomer person, you see, seducing a young boomer. And uh, the the uh, basically it's an attack on hypocrisy as you might say, uh, as it was seen in our parents' generation. And that, I mean, there's a great deal of irony in it aimed at Mrs. Robinson. I, I did watch the movie. Um, I thought the ending was interesting, where they do the revolt, they go against the parents' wishes, and they're on the bus together. Yeah, But there's... I thought it was actually a little prophetic, a little bit, if you read into that, because it's like, oh, what well, cool, good job, you revolted. Now what? Like, <sighs> like, where are you going? Where are you going? Those are two words that should never, ever be said together. But, well, well, now and what? <laughs> <laughs> we made a, they made a statement, okay? A whole generation stood up. You know what I'm saying? And they showed their fathers and their mothers what was what. And they spat in their faces and threw back at them all and everything they'd been handed. And you would come around and say, okay, now what? <laughs> that's, so that's really interesting. So the song isn't an homage to, no, to that at no. all. It's... it's almost ironical well i mean going let's see let me find the lyrics again uh because it's talking about how jesus loves mrs robinson and heaven holds a place for those who pray etc so yeah basically attacking her as a hypocritical churchgoer uh and then the uh well how the does joe Indians... dimaggio how, how, why where's the sharpness there with joe dimaggio i don't understand well, he was a symbol of the old America, just as you figured it out. 
the the idea, I guess, the basic idea here is that theirs was a hypocritical generation. They didn't understand. They didn't get it. Why their children were revolting, and they're looking to a past figure who represented some sort of stability is uh, is what that's talking about. Interestingly enough, Joe DiMaggio hated the song. He said it made him sound like he was dead, which he is now, but he wasn't then. <laughs> no, it's true. He, he really he got very annoyed with it. Yeah. What I mean, it makes it sound like I've, I've snuffed it. Huh. Remember, he became famous after this doing the Mr. Coffee commercials. Interesting. Okay. Not familiar, but interesting that um, a big time baseball player of the Yankees loses. No, don't bring it up. No, I'm not gonna watch. No, I I see what you're doing. Okay, we're moving on. Why? All right. Why? No, I just don't understand. I, why are you suddenly no. so hostile <laughs> to poor Joe Dimaggio? I don't want to see the commercial, Charles. We've Why got a show to do. It's not a time to watch Joe DiMaggio commercial. Oh, wow. We're doing an episode off the menu. You know what? Time to watch a Joe DiMaggio commercial. <laughs> well, look. I, let, let me explain something. <laughs> no, you see, I, I, I know what you're, what you're thinking. You're thinking that you're too old to be introduced to new, new art forms. <laughs> oh, look. Something got said for you. <laughs> sure. I'm, I'll watch that after the show, Charles. I'm not going to watch that during the show. I don't like this reaction thing where everyone just watches my face watching the commercial silently. I'm not going to do that. I get a kick out of it. I know you get a kick out of it. So you can enjoy my, my face and my I reaction I, after... I, I... I sent you that self-help guru's tape yeah, today, this ladies is... and gentlemen. I said to him, and you know, this guy's going out how you've got to be kind to yourself and gentle and all that. And poor Vinny here, <laughs> I could see the hatred and annoyance <laughs> zipping across his face. This is my life, ladies and gentlemen. Every Saturday, Charles sends me really <laughs> annoying videos so that he can watch my face react. Uh, uh, and then he's... You know, ladies and gentlemen, this is a complete misreading of the situation. <laughs> As... As I have been trying to do since when he was a young boy, I'm trying to expand his horizons. <laughs> and sometimes that means making him watch 50 year old Joe DiMaggio Mr. Coffee commercials. <laughs> sometimes there's just no other way to get a point across. <laughs> it really is important, ladies and gentlemen, to hold on to these. These seminal pieces of, of popular culture. I, I, I don't think you'd really understand Mrs. Robinson without watching these commercials. Oh, gosh. No, I, I, you know, see, the, this, though, I, 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 and I appeal to you, ladies and gentlemen, as the audience, I appeal to you. It isn't just Vinny. Tons of my friends and relations throughout my life have accused me of the same sorts of things. It's true. Teasing, rubbing their faces and things. Your brother always accused you of having the Virgil complex. He was you know? 100% right. That was absolute, That was one of the truest things he has ever said. It, where So the Virgil com complex is basically... Uh, so obviously... Yeah, so it's where Charles finds something bad, and he's really triggered. And so then he finds an unsuspecting person, and he says, wow, did you did you see this? Look how bad this is. And so then sort of it's put on you, and then you emotionally react, and then you get triggered. And so then for him, it's not so bad because, like, the other person is, like, carrying that weight now. See, that's a complete <laughs> misreading. <laughs> That is a complete misreading, ladies and gentlemen. I'm trying to help. It's all I've ever tried to do. And I, I, it, it hurts to think that young people in my life would think this. 
Uh, well, let's pull ourselves together, shall we? Uh, seriously, though, I, 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 I feel put upon. I, I feel, you know what I feel like right now? Having all that said about me, you know how I feel? What? I feel like Joe DiMaggio listening to Mrs. Robinson. <laughs> but I, I think you'll, you'll admit, though, that, um, you know, sitting on the sofa on a Sunday afternoon, listen to the candidates debate, laugh about it, shout about it, any way you choose, anything you do, you lose. Uh, whether or not you do cast your lonely eyes to Joe DiMaggio, which you probably should do. Uh, maybe <laughs> look up three or four old Mr. Coffee commercials <laughs> to try and establish a base of stability in your life. So this is what I'm trying to do for you. I'm trying to get you to a place where you've got this, this, this like central <laughs> foundation <laughs> that's secure and safe. And it, and it just so happens that it, for you, it could very well be Joe DiMaggio hawking a Mr. Coffee machine. You, you could, you'll be able to see why it was a nation turned its lonely eyes to this man. If doing Mr. Coffee commercials is moving up, I'm moving out. <laughs> Oh, whoa, the tables have turned. The tables have turned. That's <laughs> the master. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you forgot about Billy Joel, didn't you? You you, you forgot. I never, <laughs> I never forget about Billy. He's across the medical center. <laughs> I, uh... <laughs> All right. All right, ladies and gentlemen, before we lose your attention completely, uh, let's see what else we got going. Yeah, so, some, someone somewhere is saying, look at these two giggling cucks. Um, yeah. was, I'll never forget that. I'll never forget that throughout when that was we thrown got, at us. We got that in the first week. Yeah. Giggling cucks. Yeah. Well, and ladies and gentlemen, for those of you who are curious, it's because there is a lot to giggle at. I mean, let's face it. Thinking of those candidates' debate. You know, laugh about it, shout about it. Yeah. When you've got to choose, any way you put it, you lose. <sighs> Where did you go, Joe DiMaggio? A nation turns and slow the eyes to you. All right. Uh, no memes of production this week. Just one, one really poignant comment from uh, Superfan Nicholas. Ah. Who says uh, he's a patron, and he says last week, emotionally unavailable. That was the that was the title of the episode. Emotionally unav unavailable. This week, literally unavailable. Referring to the Damn. week you you left us. You, you were unavailable. You weren't attending uh, to our needs. You mean a nation turned its lonely eyes to me? <laughs> <laughs> now I know how Joe DiMaggio said it. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, this coffee. <laughs> what do you have in that? <laughs> it's coffee. Yeah? Yeah, it's coffee. Okay. Not for Mr. Coffee Machine. It's instant coffee. Okay. But, uh, ladies and gentlemen, I'm, I'm actually, I'm in just about Joe DiMaggio's, as I'm looking at him, I'm in just about his stance right now. You know, maybe... Offering well, maybe what America just really needs right now is a really good cup of coffee. Uh, maybe uh, Joe DiMaggio was right. Maybe he knew this. <laughs> maybe it's true. Is that why they call it a cup of Joe? That's why they call it a cup of Joe. Sure. No, it's not. It's they not. Call you oh, that. Wow. No. no. It's, it predates that by many, many years. Well, what, what, what's the origin of that? You know, I have no idea. Good question. I really don't know. But let's find out. Uh, oh, look, there's another Mr. Coffee commercial. That's not what we want. I'm surprised right. you didn't do that angle. They've got Joe DiMaggio doing coffee you know, a cup of Joe. You are so right. You are so right. I don't know. Cup of Joe. Hmm. Ah, here we go. 
Drift Away Coffee. Ah, listen to this. Hmm. I had no idea. This is great. In 1914, Secretary of the Navy Josephus Joe Daniels banned alcohol from all U.S. Navy ships. As this was close to the start of World War I, many young men would fo- soon find themselves aboard a ship where the strongest drink available was coffee or a cup of joe. What do you know? Huh. Th- I that no makes idea. perfect sense, right? Because you're it, you're, there's a dire need there, and you have a role like that. I can totally see how that turns into a thing. Yeah, it's, uh, you know, it's funny. I actually, when I wrote in my history of rum, uh, this was the ending of uh, the ending of the uh, the top of rum. Uh, I wrote about that in my history of rum. Uh, what do you know? Huh? Oh, you actually, so you actually wrote on this phenomenon? Well, I didn't mention the cup of joe. It's just that in my history of rum, I mentioned, uh, when the the order of uh, Secretary Daniels banning drink, because the rum ration was a big thing, not just in the British, but in the French, the American, many navies. And during the course of the late uh, 20th century, it got eliminated from most navies, including our own. And our own was 1914. So they, uh, but ever since order, General Order 99 uh, prohibited uh, alcohol aboard naval vessels. From then on, the strongest drink of any kind allowed on naval ships has been coffee. The presumably disgruntled and sober sailors were unhappy with the changes, so they started to call coffee a cup of joe out of spite. Isn't that fascinating? That is fascinating. And it makes sense, too. It's not, not too random. No, uh, you know, there's another, another phrase for it is a cup of mud. I haven't heard that one. I don't think I would like to drink a, a cup of mud. That I've heard of um what is it, a mudslide with a Kahlua alcoholic drink. But Well, let me, let me see. There's let me see if I remember what I think I remember correctly. Ladies and gentlemen, these excursions uh into pop culture may not impress you. Or they may. You know, it's funny things. People some people really enjoy it, others don't. But uh, I think we we you've sort of developed an audience that really likes this kind of stuff. Product nineteen, a lot of the yeah Americana. No, that that it is. Uh, huh. Yeah, this this um, it is it's it's just another use of the cup of Joe. And uh, a cup of mud I, is uh, de- derived. What are, what are you saying? No, uh, I I miss I misremembered what I thought I remembered. Um, this is another poem. It's actually a song, but you might find the lyrics the lyrics useful for October. I was out on the west coast trying to make a buck, and things didn't work out. I was down on my luck. Got tired of roaming and bumming around, so I started thumbing back east toward my hometown. Made a lot of miles the first two days. I figured I'd be home in a week if my luck held out this way. But the third night I got stranded, way out of town, at a cold, lonely crossroads. Rain was pouring down. I was hungry and freezing, done caught a chill, where the lights of a big semi topped the hill. Lord, I was sure glad to hear them air brakes come on, and I climbed in that cab where I knew it'd be warm. At the wheel sat a big man. He weighed about 210. He stuck out his hand and said with a grin, Big Joe's the name. I told him mine. And he said, The name of my rig is Phantom 309. I asked him why he called his rig such a name. He said, Son, this old Mac can put them all to shame. There ain't a driver or a rig or running any line. Ain't seen nothing but taillights from Phantom 309. Well, we rode and talked the better part of the night when the lights of a truck stop came in sight. He said, I'm sorry, son, this is as far as you go, because I got to make a turn just on off the road. Well, he tossed me a dime as he pulled her in low and said, have yourself a cup on old Big Joe. 
When Joe and his rig were out of the night and nothing flat, he was clean out of sight. Well, I went inside and ordered me a cup, told the waiter Big Joe was setting me up. Oh, you could have heard a pin drop. It got deathly quiet, and the waiter's voice turned kind of white. Well, did I say something wrong? I said with a halfway grin. He said, no, this happens every now and then. Every driver in here knows Big Joe. But son, let me tell you what happened about ten years ago. At the crossroads tonight, where you flagged them down, there was a busload of kids coming from town. They were right in the middle when Big Joe topped the hill. It could have been slaughter, but he turned his wheel. Well, Joe lost control, went into a skid, and gave his life to save that bunch of kids. And there at that crossroads was the end of the line for Big Joe at Phantom 309. But every now and then, some hawker will come by, and like you, Big Joe will give him a ride. Here, have another cup and forget about the dime. Keep it as a souvenir from Big Joe and Phantom 309. So it's derived from that, too? I, I don't understand. No, it's not. It's what conflated. I thought it what conflated in my head was Big Joe and the cup of coffee. And so Phantom 309 started running through my head, so I had to see. You know. Ah, okay. It's a, it's a ghost story. Yeah. It's a country western song. It's a ghost story. That's right. We we there's a lot of that. Um, all right. Questions. <laughs> just questions. you don't want a book of the week? Oh, uh, we're we're getting there. We're getting there. This is just just give me a little leeway here. Give me a little leeway on this one, Charles. Uh, all right. Greetings, gentlemen. Once again, this is Andrew the Elder with a question. As we enter the fall season and the inevitable celebration of All Hallows Eve. Ooh, That's Phantom 309. That's Halloween to those of you from your Belinda. Can either of you recommend some contemporary books in the horror ghost stories genre that are worthwhile reading? There you go. And Andrew the Elder is an actual book buyer in the Tumblr House bookstore because he's really smart. So whatever you recommend, Andrew the Elder will probably get. Huh. All right. Well, actually, that gives you a little more leeway, as you might say. I could name several if I wished. Do you wish to do so? Yeah, sure. But they've got to be uh, they've got to be modern, which is kind of annoying. But there is one relatively recent book, relatively emphasis, that I really, really have to recommend, especially for this time of year. It's an enchanting book, but it's a bit scary. It's called Something Wicked This Way Comes by Ray Bradbury. By the pricking in my thumbs, something wicked this way comes. Um, it's a story of, an, of a weird carnival that comes to a Midwestern town in Illinois, Greentown, which is, as always, Ray Bradbury's memory of Waukegan, Illinois. And the protagonists are two uh, two boys, two, I think they're 12, they're both about 12 years old, uh, the father of the one of them, who, um, they're the only ones in town who really, really understand what's going on, ultimately. And that's, it's, it's a very good book. I recommend a second one, since you want horror, and you want it scary, and you want it relatively modern, I will recommend what I consider to be the very best of all of Stephen King's books, Salem's Lot. When I first read that thing in high school, it scared the death out of me. Not least because, unlike Lovecraft, or for that matter, unlike Bradbury, it dealt with things that are really real, like the malaise of the church after Vatican II, which plays a big part in uh, terms of the priest in the town that is confronted suddenly with vampirism. Um, ghost stories. Now, you know, this isn't exactly modern, but if you haven't read them, they're worth dipping into. And those are the ghost stories written by a man named Montague Rhodes James, M.R. James. Ghost stories of an antiquary, more ghost stories of an antiquary, etc. Really, 
well written stuff. And it was uh, James, who was an Anglican cleric. He was first the provost of uh, King's College, Cambridge, and then of Eton College. He um, was asked, because he was very, very popular as a ghost story writer, if he believed in that sort of thing. And his response was about the truest thing anybody can say. He said, these things depend, these things happen, depend upon it, but we do not know the rules. And I, I think that's pretty much about all anybody can say about this stuff. Um, and I suppose... Well, again, we can't we can't get back into uh, into uh, deep classics, but I could also recommend Ray Bradbury's The Halloween Tree, mm. which is uh, it's partly fiction, but it's also a survey of Halloween customs and that kind of thing. Um, this time of year, you know, I really begin I really miss Ray. You know, it's not like I, I hung out with him on a regular basis or anything, but it was nice knowing that he was around to be seen. And it's it's uh, in the October country. I really miss him. But I can tell you, ladies and gentlemen, that that's part of the reason why it's a build-up for the month of all souls, as we really begin to miss our family and friends who are no longer with us. I, uh, uh, anyway, so what else we got? All right. Uh, so we, a new patron, Xenix, uh, says salutations to Mr. Frankini and Coulomb, the modern worlds, Justinian and Belisarius. Oof. I am a Catholic monarchist Croat and newly minted patron of this wonderful program. Regarding the comparison, Charles, who is so wise, yet bellicose, charges into wonderful new topics to expand the conversation like Belisarius did the Eastern Empire. And Vincent, like Justinian, must keep him on a leash with channel identifications and worry about the money. Uh, I would... <laughs> oh, that's unfair. I think very apt. Very apt. That's dead who on, introduced, actually. Who introduced you to Joe DiMaggio? Huh? Answer that. Thank you for signing, uh, finally signing up, by the way, Zenix. I, I know you're a top commenter. I really appreciate and, and, and love all your comments uh, over the years. So thank you a lot. It means a lot to us. Uh, so he says, I would like to ask Mr. Coulomb to please tell us what he knows about, uh, what is this, Dr. Ante Starchevich. Is, is that right, doctor? Uh, yeah. Uh, doctor no. yeah, not uh, Ante. And, Ante Starchevich. And the Croatian Party of Rights. Would he please give a general overview of these dozens of little national parties that were active in Central Europe in the 19th century? The Party of Rights seems to be the closest thing Croats have, have had to an organized form of legitimism. Thank you and God bless. Well, that's not entirely true. Uh, Dr. Stotsevich, uh was... An interesting character because he was very much affected through the priests who taught him by the ideals of the French Revolution. The priests had lived in the Illyrian provinces, as they were called, of uh, Croatia that were taken by the French from Austrian control. Um, and he, he passed them on to Stasevic. Stasevic... Um, one, he, he uh, on the one hand, he was very much against the idea of the Croatians and this party of rights. We're very much against the idea of the Croatians launching uh, into a union with the other South Slavs. But he wasn't a friend of the Habsburgs or the church either. Uh, he wanted an independent Croatia with a severely limited church and, a, uh, uh, and no connection with either Austria or Hungary. Um, one of his one-time allies turned opponents was uh, Archbishop Strassmeyer of Zagreb, 
who on the one hand was a great Croatian nationalist uh, and Illyrian nationalist, as, as you might say, because he wanted to include Slovenes, Croats, and Serbs in one country, but under the Habsburgs. Now, that was called Illyrianism at that time. Uh, Stasevich, interestingly, his father was Croat, but his mother was Serb. So it's interesting that he was strictly a Croatian nationalist, had no interest in the Serbs. Uh, he led a, uh, he was connected to, and the party of rights got suppressed over an anti Habsburg uh, uh, insurrection that didn't go anywhere. Mm. So, no, he had some good ideas. He had some interesting ideas. Of course, he's very much in the pantheon of Croatian heroes today. But the um, the sources of a number of national parties throughout Austria-Hungary were um, connected with the rise of the Catholic Party. Um, because the Catholic Party was interesting. It was in Austria, it was in Czech Bohemia, it was in Hungary, it was in Croatia, it was in Slovenia, it was, in, it was all over the place. And the, the different regions were nationalist to a degree, but they were all connected because of the church and they had a shared loyalty to the House of Habsburg. Uh, it was on their insights to a great degree from the different nationalities that Franz Ferdinand ultimately assembled his idea of the federalizing of the empire, which could possibly have worked very well. But of course he died in 1914, so we'll never know. Uh, but that's that's what I know. Uh, what about the aspect of where Zenix is asking for a general overview of the dozens of little national parties that were active in the Central Europe in the 19th century? Well, this is what I mean. They they came into various varieties. There, there were there were some of them were Catholic, some of them were anti-Catholic, some of them were pro-Habsburg, some of them were anti-Habsburg. Uh, the anti-Habsburgs were basically our our own nationality alone. Whereas the uh, the uh, pro Habsburg parties, both from a sense of loyalty and a sense of realism, knew that uh, while they wanted more freedom for the especially the Hungarian possessions to include Croatia, while they wanted more freedom for self development on the one hand, they knew that their separate national existence cut off from the other nations that formed the empire would be difficult, if not impossible, and that also some terrible things might happen. Uh, they would, they refused basically to see their particular nationality in a vacuum, ignoring all the others. And that, you know, if you're dealing with Central Europe, the more you ignore your neighbors, the less reality, the less part of reality you are. Okay. All right. Uh, so shameless plug. I need, I need to do more, more of these plugs. Uh, become a patron uh, for as low as $5 a month. Uh, that Patreon added a really cool new feature recently where you can actually do a free trial for a week. So no risk. Just try it out for a week. See, see how it works for you. Uh, maybe it doesn't work. Maybe it does. Uh, you send in your questions right now. We're only asking questions from from uh, patrons. Um, get access to the pre-show. It's usually about twenty to forty minutes per week, uh, and you also get the audio and the audio feed for that too. It's not just on the YouTube channel. Uh, get early access. Usually, it's Saturday night or Sunday that I'm able to, to put the 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 show up. I get free shipping in the TumblrHouse.com bookstore. Uh, and last, last but not least, uh, get twenty percent off all the merchandise. You see the the tapestry behind me. You see the tapestries behind Charles, uh, particularly the um, the Habsburg coat of arms and the Sacre Coeur, right there. Those are those are two items that are in the um, our Teespring store. So 
get a uh, a code for twenty percent off those items. Um, but so wait, there's more. There, there actually will be more. I'm trying. I'm, I'm trying to to add more and more things. I'm, I'm really um, eager You've to. You missed the most obvious one. Uh, <sighs> free shipping and handling. I said free shipping and handling. Oh well, free sh- I, maybe I, I didn't deliver it like that. Free shipping and handling in the bookstore. That's right. Thank you. Yeah, absolutely, you. patrons. You're free shipping. A lot of a lot of patrons are taking advantage of that as well. So uh, I know Andrew uh, Andrew the Elder. I don't know if you've been taking advantage of this, but you're a patron now, so you should be getting free shipping. Um, so yeah. not an actor. Yeah, absolutely. Now, while supplies last. Batteries not included. Void were prohibited. Sorry, no CODs. Be the first on your block. Operators are standing by. I feel like we missed one or two, but we got most of them. Um, Some assembly required. (laughs) Uh, What is it? Best best, uh, under age two. The uh, intended for uh, ages two and under. <laughs> all right. Um, all right. A question from Noble Cobra. He says, can Charles tell us anything about the institution of court jester? When did it get started? When did it end? Or did the jesters evolve into politicians? Are there any interesting examples of historical jesters or any traditions feasts and customs associated with the position and always remember the pellet with the poison is in the vessel with the pestle but the chalice from the palace has the brew that is true yes indeed that is the rhyme that was thrown at danny k in the movie the court jester back in 1950 something uh delivered by mildred natwick and whoever the uh the heroine was in an attempt to give him that mnemonic so he could swallow from the right and glass and not the wrong one. Because right. you see, you see, what it was was that the, po- the pill with the poison went into the vessel with the pestle, whereas the chalice with the palace held the, the brew that was true. You got it. That's right. Yeah. See, if it were me and said Danny Kay, I wouldn't have been poisoned. <laughs> but no, the the uh, the court jesters, I mean, they were also called fools. And they were often, although not always, dwarves. Uh, and their job was to joke and entertain. But they very often told the truth. Truths that their masters could not hear from anyone else because they were veiled in humor. Um, what, what, does I suppose, mean, what, what does that mean they told the truth was that like their role or the, or some just decided to because that seems like a like a sort of virtue was, there that is discretionary it was oddly enough oddly enough it was sort it was discretionary now mind you it also meant that their master could hear the truth from somebody you see what I mean because you're 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 putting a lot of of characteristics, a very specific characteristics, on an entire job position. You're you're, you're putting like like truth seeker, courageous. Oh, so it, this is part of the job description. This is your qualifications. You need to be a truth very, seeker. You very, need to be courageous. Very often, and of course, the the jester was supposedly given a certain amount of freedom in his opinions, because he was a jester or a fool or whatever. But the truth was that very often they were very canny people. Uh, they might have been physically malformed or, or, or dwarves or whatever, but they generally, they often anyway, had a very clear view of things, which their royal master often could not have just because of his position. Because the other thing was that people would talk around jesters and ignore them, and they could would pick up things that uh, the king would not have heard. I think Charles the First was the last one to have a jester, if I remember correctly. 
I could be wrong, but I don't think so. And if I remember, Henry VIII's uh, jester had something to say. Yeah, Jeffrey Hudson. Well, that was a very popular, very loyal. Uh, and he actually fought on the royalist side uh, during the war. Uh, during the uh, Henry VIII, employed a jester named Will Summers. The best known court jester believed to be a natural fool of Henry VIII. Uh, he uh, Yeah, he, he uh, yeah, such individuals were um, permitted uh, familiarities without regard for deference, and Summers presented a, a shrewd wit which he exercised even on Cardinal Wolseley. He did, however, occasionally uh, overstep the boundaries. In 1535, the king threatened to kill Summers with his own hand. After Sir Nicholas Crewe did recall Queen Anne Boleyn, a ribald, and the Princess Elizabeth, a bastard. Uh, well, he, uh, he stayed at court, eventually retiring during uh, uh, the reign of uh, Elizabeth. Uh, But obviously, he had Catholic sympathies, and that's interesting. So, what about the appearance of a jester? As we, in the collective, in our in the collective modern mind, we we picture someone with a, a coxcomb hat, you know, a cap with branching bells. out bells, stuff, um, stuff like that. Was that true? Yeah. Yeah. They had the bells to make people laugh and to dance around and hear the bells and all that. Hmm. Okay. Anything else? Any any other interesting factoids there? Well, just that it's interesting that today and for many, many years prior, comedy in general has sought to occupy the role of the, of the court jester. Every comedian has a point, you know, and I've never yet met a comedian who wasn't, uh, to some degree, a, a philosopher. That's actually true. There is, it, it, there is some truth. There is some, like I, I think of like a lot. Some of George Carlin's very witty but very true things there. Some insights into human humanity. I guess you could say. No. You know. No. Um. I so, agree. Carlin, when Carlin wasn't foul, he was very funny. Right. Very, very funny. So that's interesting. Modern comedian as the role of the court jester. No. Hmm. All right. Uh, next uh, question is from Will. Who sa oh, actually, I'm sorry. I totally skipped um, some other things, uh, uh, aspects of this question. Are there... Um, any traditions, feasts, or customs associated with the position? Well, the Feast of Fools, of course, um, April Fools is kind of connected to it. Kind of? No, kind of. I is mean, it, is it, it that old? Yeah, yeah. Not always on the 1st of April, but the, the, the idea of a, of a day given over to reversing everything and, and trying to trick people, that's very old. Hmm. Okay. All right. Uh, all right. Question from Will. He says, what are Charles's thoughts on Empress Elizabeth of Austria, the wife of Franz Joseph? Well, she was sort of the princess die of the 19th century. Uh, she married for love, but she really did not, I think, understand what was going to be entailed by her marriage. Uh, she seems like a very nice lady in a lot of ways, but very naive. And 
you know, she, she also runs a little bit of Audrey Hepburn in uh, Breakfast at Tiffany's because she felt like a wild creature that had been trapped. Um, and certainly her mental state became somewhat more difficult after her uh, son was murdered or committed suicide. Um, but she had a hard life, a very difficult and sad life in so many ways. Much of it self-inflicted, but a lot of it simply the situation she found herself in. So, I mean, I'm not what you would call a huge sissy fan. There's a whole, whole, uh, the whole uh, genre of bric-a-brac that are called sissy kitsch around here. It's just kitsch, you know, bad taste stuff all having to do with the Empress Elizabeth. But having said that, you know, she I, I think she really counts as a tragic figure. Not a heroine, but definitely a tragic figure. Hmm. Okay, Warren says, Hello, Vincent and Charles. While I was rereading parts of Puritan's Empire uh, for my history class, I was reminded of the conflict between George III and Parliament. How did this play into the American Revolution? It's commonly stated that Georgia III was in favor of the various acts the colonists got upset about. But how much was his idea and how much was the Whigs? Did the king and parliament agree on the America question in any way? And if they differed, where was it? I find it interesting but not surprising. Charles Watson Wentworth submitted the De Declaratory Act which said, quote, Parliament can do whatever it wants to the colonies, end quote, but also feared the increase in royal power in the colonies. I suppose in simple terms, what was the relation between the three-way standoff between the colonial factions, the king, and Parliament? Did it evolve through the crisis and into the revolution? I know it ended with Parliament ending George III's attempt at restoring some royal power, but what was her relationship before? Well, this is a very good question. First thing you have to bear in mind is that 12 of the 13 colonies had been founded directly uh, through the actions either of either or both the colonists or King Charles I, King Charles II, or King James II, um, without any reference to Parliament or the government. Um, with the overthrow of King James II, which became, uh, which was popular amongst most Americans at that time, um, you you ended up with government at one remove, as it were, with um, first William of Orange and then the the German, uh, uh, well, Queen Anne, then the German princess uh, uh, son George. These um, these did not have a great deal of colonial policy. The biggest colonial policy was fighting the French and Spanish, and that was about it. Uh, it was only after those threats were ended in King George III's reign that they began to follow some real issues. Uh, part of it, of course, was that George... Um, George and every government under him, whether or not he supported them, faced the same problem, which was that in the French and Indian Wars, the uh, the British had run up a huge bill for the defense of the colonies, and that continued because they still needed a navy to protect them, and they still needed garrisons out on the frontier, all of which had to be paid for, and which were paid for by the British taxpayer. So government after government, uh, whether or not they were in the king's favor, tried to do something about this basic problematic issue. How do we get the colonies to pay a symbolic amount? We know we will never get them to pay what they owe and what they, and what they cost us. We'll never get that. But how can we get them to pay a symbolic amount so that the British taxpayer will not feel that these freeloaders are just getting everything, you know, as a free ride, which, of course, they were. So that was an issue that uh, cabinet after cabinet wrestled with. 
And it's interesting that most of the things that they talked about taxing were luxury items that only the wealthy used. So that's why it was the wealthy who precipitated the uh, revolution. Now, as to how they interacted, uh, once George III uh, managed to get a prime minister of his own, choosing Lord North in, in 1770, he was still stuck with the same problem that all the succeeding or the preceding prime ministers had had. How do you extract a small amount of money to placate the British taxpayer and show that his investment has not been for nothing? Well, they tried one thing after another, uh, but after Lord North came to power, the Whigs did everything they could to bring his government down. And that, in essence, actually included throwing the American Revolution. Three times Sir William Howe allowed Washington to escape. Uh, and then after he retired, he went back to Britain, took up his role as an MP in the Whig section, and he had to face the Board of Enquiry as to his behavior. And so when he was asked what I've just mentioned, you know, you, you uh, had him and you had Washington in your grasp three times, let him go, why'd you do that? Uh, his response was, the answer to that question is political, and I choose not to give it. So... Um, Basically, the king, uh, he had one foot tied behind his back. He was not in real charge. Uh, um, so, the, the, so it seems like parliament, so parliament, was parliament rep representing the people in terms of, okay, we need to, we need to get a return on investment, so to speak? Well, yeah, in that sense, because Parliament was not really representative, per se, in those days. We think of people being represented today if they can vote. Okay. But uh, but Parliament, in those days, the only people who could vote were property owners who would have to pay taxes. If you didn't pay taxes, you couldn't vote. Now, bear in mind the reason for that. Why was Parliament in the various European countries, the different estates, why did they exist? Well, they existed primarily uh, to advise the king and to raise money for him if he did not have sufficient means beyond regular administration. Regular administration was usually paid for out of the crown estates. But what if you've got an invasion? Or what if you've got a famine? What do you got this? What do you got that? Well, then you call the estates because if you have to raise a new tax, that new tax should be voted on by the representatives of the people who are going to be paying it. And people who weren't going to be paying it were not represented in Parliament. You see? So uh, that's why the whole question of the British taxpayer was so important. Because those were the voters. So, long and the short of it was that he, uh, the king, uh, threw his hands up. Really, uh, the colon, the colonial oligarchies wanted complete control in their realm, uh, and they tried. Some of them tried to get the king to break with Parliament. Now that just wasn't going to happen. He sworn an oath to uphold the Act of Settlement of 1689, which made Parliament sovereign in Great Britain, i.e. superior to the king. And he was not going to go against that. So, oof, it became what it became. And as um, Eric Nelson, the Royalist Revolution, declared that when the war was over and the Constitution was finally written and, and ratified, uh, in Britain, uh, well, on one side of the water, you would have a monarchy without a king, and on the other side, a king without a monarchy. And that's what we've ended up with. So the United States are, in a real sense, uh, a monarchy that doesn't have a king. 
And Britain, of course, they have a king, but he has no power. I remember from many years ago, very early on in the show, you did say we do have a king, but he's a deaf, dumb, and blind king. Yeah. The Constitution of the United States. No. no. Deaf, dumb, blind, and immortal, seemingly. At least he doesn't age beyond, you know, he does have a birthday, so he's not eternal. What did you do for Constitution Day three weeks ago? All right, next question. Um, <laughs> oh, we're not interested in Constitution Day? You know, I missed it, Charles. I just, I missed it. You know what else you missed? What? The Mid-Autumn Festival. What is that, with the, with the moon cakes? Yes. You're in the center of the great of one of China's greatest cities, Arcadia. Uh, did you get a, Did you get a moon cake? We're not in. We're we're not. Why do you, we're not in China? This is California, Charles. No, yeah, so it needs some help. <laughs> it needs a little extra quality that China can help with. I, I did not have a moon cake. I'm sorry to say, but I see. Did you go out and stare at the moon? I uh, no, I not beautiful. on that particular day. No, no. Uh, you know, you know what I was doing? I was working extra hard uh, along with old Rose because we had to play catch up because of your your weekend off, your extra week off. Everyone was behind, so, uh, so old Rose had straight. to pick up the slack. So basically, you folks are trying to guilt me for doing your jobs. I get it. All right. And we, we, no, that's we, fine. There was a loss in revenue, so we had to make that up with gift shop sales. <laughs> so that, <laughs> well, we know about those. <laughs> How are the so toasters going? It, anyway, <laughs> it, it, it put a strain on the system, Charles. Okay, we had to we had to make some decisions that <laughs> we we had to make some tough decisions. Let's just say that. How are the toasters going? That's what I want to know. <laughs> Toasters are going fine, okay? The, the, Tumblr, are... the Tumblr House gift shop is the only gift shop I know that has toasters and towels and dry, uh, what is it, uh, the uh, the handheld dryers, you know, electric yeah. dryers. Right. They're brought in by the carton load. Yeah. I mean, no, no other tourist attraction in the San Gabriel Valley has that kind of a gift shop. It's San Gabriel Valley's greatest hidden secret. <laughs> I'll say. <laughs> I'll say. Right there alongside the toaster ovens they sell. And the uh, the uh, irons. Yeah. So. Mops. Anyhow. Aprons. We, we, we can only pick up the slack once every so often, Charles. We can't just do that consecutively, okay? <laughs> we There are environmental factors that come into place that prevent us from just simply... <laughs> doing this every week okay so yeah it, i know it, I, I, it, it, what some people call environmental <laughs> factors other other people call a, a lull in commerce a a, a uh, sometimes it's it's uh, you know when the heat's on is a phrase oh speaking of which i, I know you'll be happy about this one of my uh one of my uh uh classmates here in fact dad divide he uh he's got a new room in uh in this building and it's actually more than uh, it's bigger than my place it's got an extra storeroom but the storeroom is filled with mattresses so he has to constantly go to the mattresses well see he said you know what's this smell i said hey i said danny you know how it is when you're in a theological institute. Sometimes these theological questions get tough. But that happens sometimes, not often. It's rare. Sometimes you just got to go to the mattresses. He was impressed. <laughs> I bet. Well, you know, yes. Yeah, so well, what's an example? I said, the Arian heresy. We really had to go to the mattresses that time. The Nestorians, the Monophysites, 
the iconoclasts every time we had to go to the mattresses. And here we remember, and we're ready. If we ever we got to go to the mattresses again, we're ready. Yeah. The Mono- we, there was a monophysite uprising in, in Jersey a couple years back. People forget about this. See? We went to the mattresses then. Yeah. I remember having to help out at the casino in Parsippany, New Jersey, during the great monophysite uprising, which, as you recall, in those days, it was one of the last Frankini... Uh, uh, for, uh, 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 investments. Yeah, right, investments. Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. Investments. Investments. Yep. Mm-hmm. Uh, on the East Coast. Yeah. It was one of the very last before your your. Uh, I guess it was it was uh, not my mom and your dad, but I think it was your great uncle. Anyway, whichever it was, when he closed it out, that was it was one of the very last of the family investments on the East Coast. So um, your your cousin there, Don Marco, he was in charge of the casino in those days, and I go, you know, and I thought I was I I was been hired as a comedian. That's what I thought. Ha, ha! I show up in in a dinner jacket, you know, black tie and all that. I said I'm ready to perform. He says, Oh, you ready to perform? How do you perform with firearms? I said, What? He said, did anybody tell you we're going to the mattresses here for the casino? And I, 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 was, I was absolutely horrified. But then I, it was a little bit better because it turned out they were having a magician that night who literally would pull women out of a mattress. And that's what he was talking about. Ah, there you go. I was relieved. I bet. All right, final question for this episode is from John, who says, I would like to know who are Charles's favorite political dynasties in America? This can be on the national, state, and local level. Is this other than the Frankinis? Other than the Frankinis, uh, the Kennedys, you know, the obvious. The Manicottis? The Manicottis? Well... Let, we don't talk about if you the put no it, look if you put the Manicotis on your favorite political dynasty just there's the door okay loose lips not a word I won't say anything about the Manicotti okay not a single word are you going to Nicola Manicotti's party <sighs> I mean I think it would be in the interest of peace of maintaining the current, you know, I think I think it would be a smart move. That's all I'm saying, boss. I'm going. Obligations, you know, it, it's I think diplomacy. that's very smart. Diplomacy. I think, think that's a very smart show, idea. Showing respect. Four hours out of your life, you bring two bottles of Dago Red as a gift. I'm telling you, it's 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 time well spent and wine well spent. This is the way of things. That's how it. That's just how it looks from this side of the water. That's all I'm saying. I won't say any more about it. But now, moving back, moving along, uh, I would say, well, the Kennedys are, of course, the the um, the quote unquote political dynasty that people always think of. I don't like them, so I don't want to talk about them. Yeah. So we'll leave the Kennedys alone. Uh, the next would be the Roosevelts. Um, Skip. Well, I mean, I like Teddy, but uh, did it start no. with Teddy? Well, see, this is the interesting thing. It did start with Teddy, but the Roosevelts as a family uh, go way, way, way back in time. They split in the 1700s, into two branches. One was in uh, Long Island, uh, Oyster Bay, and that was Teddy's bunch. And then the other went up the Hudson to Hyde Park, and that was Franklin's bunch. Teddy's bunch stayed Dutch Reformed. I think Franklin's grandfather turned Episcopalian. Uh, So I'm all for the uh, Oyster Bay Roosevelt's, but not the Hyde Park Roosevelt's. But interestingly, uh, Franklin married Eleanor Roosevelt, 
who was Teddy's uh, niece. That's okay. And because her father had died, Teddy Roosevelt gave Eleanor away at her wedding to Franklin. Isn't that breaking some sort of rule? I mean, what isn't that? No. No, but it was interesting that uh, they were married on St. Patrick's Day. And that was because it was the only day that Teddy could get up to New York. And that was because he was supposed to be in the St. Patrick's Day parade. So he, he skipped out? He, he's like, I don't want to no, go to he, the St. He didn't skip out. Oh, oh, he oh, went up for the parade. Oh, I you see. see, he couldn't go up for any other reason. Because I see. see, in those days, presidents who had brains had to stay close to the White House usually. So they couldn't, they couldn't find a date when he would be available to just leave D.C. and go up for no reason. So they took the, the pre-existing agreement that he would go up to New York for the St. Patrick's Day thing, and he took, he did the parade, and then he uh, went to the wedding. I see. Okay. So the uh, um, so the Roosevelts I don't really care for. The Adamses. Um, uh, well, they're not so bad. They're kind of extinct, but they're not so bad. I liked Charles Francis Adams, Henry Adams, John Quincy Adams. I liked them. Oh, the Livingstons in New York. What about the Carrolls? Uh, are are the Carrolls a dynasty? Yes, and no, I don't like them. Oh. Okay. Um, I mean, these are the big time dynasties, or I'm really interested if there's any sort of like state and local well, dynasties, you know? Well, of course, there were the Longs in Louisiana, Huey Long, and really, his, uh, yeah, Huey Long and his brother uh, Earl Long and his son Russell Long. Who were an interesting well, bunch. Well, I guess part of the question is how long do you, does it have to go on for you to become a quote unquote dynasty? You know? See, that's a that's a hard question because the in America they haven't lasted long. Yeah. In exactly. other words, yeah. Uh, so we don't really have any major families that are as prominent now as they were at the time of the revolution. We just don't. That I mean, that makes sense. Uh, that makes sense. They, they may still have money to a degree, but they're not. They don't play a big role in national life. Is that is that perhaps connected to just your power being equivalent to your wealth in America? I don't. Yeah. I don't know. I've never, I've never really speculated about it. I just know that part of it, I think, is because we're such an individualistic country that people, even of, of well-to-do dynasties, really don't think that much in terms of the future with regard to them. You know, they don't. Uh, they don't. They just don't sit down and think, well, where are we going to be in 500 years? And the we doesn't mean much to them. Hmm. I see. Well, that makes sense. Okay. That's all I can figure. So, uh, so is that is that the li um is that the list for the dynasties? Um. Yeah, pretty much. I mean, uh, the Perezes ran Saint uh, Saint uh, uh, Bernard's parish. And Pike Mean Parish in Louisiana. Of course, the, you know your favorite governor of California, Jerry Brown, followed in the footsteps of his father, Pat Brown, who was governor when my family and I came to California. Um, there was no Reagan dynasty. Uh, there was no Eisenhower dynasty, despite his best efforts. just hasn't been a great deal put through permanently. Okay. Well, that's okay. 
All right, uh, that's it for this episode, everyone. Uh, Charles, any closing? Uh, oh yes, 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 yes. I'll be going to Budapest next week to do a conference on Catholic conservative, uh, Catholic conservatism or conservative Catholicism in Germany after World War II. The uh, Neues Abendland group, as an example. Um, and if that weren't bad enough, I am two chapters away from finishing the Zeta book. Yay. Yay. Yeah. 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 So anyway, I think that's about all I got. All right. That's awesome. Uh, again, if you want to become a patron, you can do so on, uh, there's a link to it on, in the description. Uh, we'd love to have, have you guys, um, you guys make the show possible. Um, for sure. But remember, if it's Monday, it's off the menu. And the soul you save be your own. See you next time, everyone.